Hello, everyone. Welcome from around the world to the annual reunion for the Science Internship Program. If we've not met before, my name is Sierra Schneider, and I am lucky enough to be the Assistant Director for SIP. I want to briefly give you a preview of this evening's program. We have a slide to share about that so you all can see what's coming up for us this evening. Hopefully you've had a chance to spend the last hour in our Wonder platform so that you can mix and mingle and socialize with old friends and new friends alike. I was there earlier and I was reminding everyone to remember to sign the guest book tonight. We do have gift favors that we're giving out and they'll arrive in January if you're sure to sign the guest book this evening. In the first hour of our program, we are going to have some SIP alumni who are interns as well as alumni who are mentor alumni speaking with us. And in the second hour this evening, we have our keynote speaker as well as a program update from Raja and um, some closing remarks from a special guest. Then from nine to 10, we'll be back in wonder for what we call the after party. So you'll have a chance to screen share with Raja, take a photo if you would like to in the version of a screen capture, um, and just have a chance to check in with some of your friends that you haven't seen in a while. So thanks for this slide. I do want to share some, some welcome remarks for all of you. I have been, um, I keep saying I have the dubious honor of being one of the first 100% employees for SIP. And I started in this position as assistant director about two and a half years ago. And the last two years of that two and a half years have brought many changes to the world, including to us here at the SIP program, as well as to the program itself. We've pivoted to an online program these past two summers, 100% remote online for everyone who was able to attend. It opened some doors for folks around the world to attend who might not normally be able to come to Santa Cruz. And we've grappled with how to meet the challenges that the world has foisted upon us as well as upon the students that we serve. And so sometimes when we contemplate the work that we do in this world where we currently exist, we sometimes find ourselves wondering if what we do is still relevant and if what we do is enough. And you may have noticed that the passwords for tonight and the emails that have gone out this fall have sounded the refrain that SIP is you. And this is the answer that gives us the determination to continue our work and to find meaning in every success. In our recent honing of the SIP mission to advance equity in all fields of research, which Raja will talk about more later in tonight's program, our work has come alive in a new way, not just through what we do, but through what you do. We welcome interns to SIP each year, and yes, we give them the opportunity to experience firsthand what real-world, open-ended research is all about. But what we really give them is a map and a compass to find and follow the work that they feel called to in this world. And the work that's needed in today's world is not just one thing. There is not just one solution to everything that's happening around us. And each of you takes your research in a new direction, improving the world where your feet are planted. And this is where the work of SIP takes root, through your growth. So when we say that SIP is you, this is what we mean. And when we say that tonight is the event where we come together to celebrate the SIP community each year, this is what we celebrate, you, and the work that you do in this world. So thank you all for being part of SIP in the many, many ways that are present here this evening, from interns who've participated and taken the work out into the world in new ways, to mentors whose research is presently shaping the world at large and the lives of our interns, and to those who've given of your time and resources to champion and sustain our work in the world. We celebrate you all and we welcome you. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker this evening. Kira Tang is a SIP 2021 alumna who participated in one of the three COVID-19 related research projects this summer, Biomolecular Engineering 04, Bioinformatics Pipeline to calculate the frequency of viral variants of concern versus time in a geographic location. 
After the conclusion of SIP this summer, Kira led a team of interns from the COVID-19 research projects to participate in the Omics Research Symposium hosted by Pine Biotech, where their poster won first place. Kira is a junior at Lexington High School in Lexington, Massachusetts. Welcome, Kira. Hi everyone. So as Sierra just said, um, I'm Kira and I'm a high school junior I'm from Lexington, Massachusetts. And um, I am um, a fairly new um, alumna. I was a SIP intern just last summer and it was such an exciting journey. So prior to SIP 2021, I had zero research experience, um, but the project um, was the project applied to interests that I already developed beforehand, which included sort of this combination of biology, math, and programming. So the project that I worked on with um, my peers and my mentors, um, as Sierra said, was centered around analysis of techniques that allowed us to sort of better understand and get a better feel for the mutations between the um, SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern. Um, and sort of look at how these mutations will affect um, the virulence of these variants. And it was such an honor to be part of a project that hoped to benefit public health and what I see, especially as like I look at the news um, and know about what's happening right now with the Omicron variant. It's such a currently relevant and impactful topic. And um, we definitely hope um, with this project and hopefully we'll continue the research to benefit public health, health and help people, um, continue to help people who, um, well, continue to help people who, um, well, the whole world right now, and yeah. So in addition to exploring all these topics, um, besides the research that we did, it was also a wonderful opportunity to connect with people who makes it possible, which include Raja, Sierra, um, all the mentors and my fellow interns. Um, especially as a non-Californian SIP intern, it was really great to be able to make these connections with people from different parts of the US and different people from around the world. And um, regarding sort of this furthering of our research and um, presenting outside of the SIP community, um, it was also really great to keep in touch with my group members, and we also um, check on each other sometimes too, uh, especially as we progress through the school year. Um, so as somebody who only experienced SIP remotely, um, it was still wonderful to be a part of that community, and it really felt like we were building community. Um, and it was a deeply rewarding um, personal experience and academic experience. Um, so it was such an honor to speak to you all today. Sierra, back to you. Thank you so much, Kira. Thank you for being here. It's three hours later in Massachusetts. So thanks for coming and visiting with us tonight. Our second speaker this evening is Seema Lal. Seema is a SIP 2018 alumna who attended Eastside College Prep School in East Palo Alto, California, and now she attends UC Santa Cruz as a proposed double major in cognitive science and business. She shares an apartment and on-campus housing with three other SIP alumni who are all pursuing studies related to the research they did as SIP interns. Welcome, Seema. Thanks, Sierra. And hi, everyone. I'm Seema Lal. And as Sierra stated, I'm a SIP 2018 alumna. And my experience as a SIP in intern was definitely a memorable one. Um, to start off, I was part of an ongoing research project in the psychology department that was studying whether or not having siblings affected the college experience of undergrad students. Um, and it was definitely a cool project to work on. I myself am an only child. So knowing the positives of having siblings while in college was definitely something I had to talk to my parents about. Um, anyways, I also got to learn more about statistics and data and work with statistical software. And it definitely also piqued my interest in psychology, which is now why I'm a cognitive science major. So during 
my time at SIP, I worked with two PhD students, a psych professor, and three other SIP interns. And working with them made it all worth waking up at 6.30 in the morning to go get breakfast at the dining hall, then to catch the loop, and then walk uphill to the social sciences building by 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, but in all honesty, being at SIP allowed me to meet some of the most wonderful people I know. That was the time I got close to my bestest friends and getting to know and hanging out with Raja and all the staff was just all part of the fun. Since I was also living in the dorms, because this was pre-COVID, being an intern at SIP also helped me live the college experience before I was even in college. And it definitely taught me work-life balance in a way because I had to learn to be a more responsible student, not just you know, in terms of academics, but also in terms of life. And being able to do so in a high school summer internship definitely helped me when it came to the real thing. Now, as a second year college student, I can definitely say my lived experience during SIP made my actual college experience a much more positive one because I was definitely more prepared um, at living a life away from home. And in case it wasn't obvious, SIP also contributed to my college decision. Like Sierra mentioned, I'm a second year student at UCSC and I definitely chose UCSC because once again, being at SIP made me more comfortable with the campus and it definitely felt like home. I'm more than thankful for my SIP experience and a big thanks to the SIP staff for making SIP such a memorable one. Thank you. Thank you, Seema. So wonderful to have all of you here tonight and see all your faces. Our third speaker this evening and our last intern alumni speaker comes to us all the way from Diyarbakir, Turkey. Gul Karen Aka is a SIP 2021 alumna who participated in Physics 01, Multiphysics Electrothermal Simulation of Memristors. Karen is a junior at Diyarbakir Bacheshehir College Science and Technology High School. She was recently selected as a global winner by RISE, an initiative of Schmidt Futures and the Rhodes Trust, where she will benefit from lifelong support in her work solving the world's most pressing problems. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Um, hi, everyone. I am Karan from Diyarbakir, Turkey. Uh, this past summer, I was a SIP intern at physics department investigating multi-physics electrothermal simulations of memristors. So uh, can you please see my slide? Thank you. Uh, so, um, to give a glance of how my project is, um, so memristors are resistors that can change their resistance based on the history of voltage past, uh, similar to the neural networks in the brain. Our goal with my friends Evelyn and Jacob and mentor Ali was to create mathematical models with Python to describe electronic properties of and the most affecting materials for memristors. Beyond such a fruitful and uh, memorable research experience, what indeed made this experience memorable for me was uh, the inclusive and supportive community at SIP. Um, I feel like I feel like I was in a place I truly belong to. Then I dive deep into a real and existing research project at UC, UC Santa Cruz. I, I, I had almost zero experience with Python modeling and research. Uh, thanks to the research and Python workshops, I was immersed with the right resources and methods to extract the most out of this opportunity. Um, through SIF, I was able to grasp the nature of research through practical experience by the application of accepted methods and best practices, um, data connection, collection and analysis, and um, some effective communication of research findings. Um, also, I learned that, <laughs> this is also a quotation from Raja, um, science is a team sport. It's all about human connections. Um, to illustrate, my friends were also ones that kept me going whenever the research got impossible to overcome. So thank you guys once again for, for taking and sharing this experience with me. 
Um, moreover, um, I'm so grateful and humbled to humbled about my relationship collabor and collaboration with Raja and Sarah to make the research experience, or at least a glance of it, accessible for high school students, specifically in my country, Turkey and Syria. Uh, we organized two events together, a fast-paced glance into soup workshops and shadow the scientist se session with Raja um, to cover critical skills and knowledge to dive into research and to learn how modern science goes. Um, to name, uh, in the shadow of the scientist session, we shadow Raja's research team as they operated Lick Observatory Shane 3 meter telescope in California. Both events were super exciting and informative. Many people contact me for tip application tips and for sharing their happiness for being part of an amazing workshop. Um, to catch you guys up, to catch all you guys up, um, Sarah will be providing a link for the recording and resources Raja shared with us. And once again, Raja, thank you for your excitement, interest, and caring. Um, in a nutshell, uh, I'm so thankful and proud to take this opportunity and to see all you guys here after an unforgettable summer. I'm looking forward to hearing about and sharing my future achievements with the beautiful community and seeing how SIP and its impact will grow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, and it's uh, good of you to stay up into the odd hours of the night because i know it's uh you know it's the middle of the night in turkey it's been a pleasure hosting you for shadow the scientists and for our introduction to research i'll say more about that in a bit uh, at this point because i have um great pleasure of introducing amanda quirk our next speaker amanda has been a mentor in the science internship program not one year but for multiple years and um it's a privilege that I get to work closely with Amanda. Amanda's a, a, one of my PhD students, and this is our fifth year working together. Uh, Amanda is an amazing scientist. She's amazing at outreach. She's amazing at everything she does. And I will let you uh, let her tell you about her science. Um, it's been a wonderful journey studying, uh, you know, one of our neighboring galaxies. So, Amanda, please take it away. Thank you for that very nice introduction, Raja. I'm excited to be here. As Raja said, I have been a mentor for SIP for several years, and every year I am so impressed by the maturity and the creativity that the high school students have, and it's really an honor to work with them. And I'm excited to share some work that has been really impacted by what they've discovered. So today I'm going to be talking to you all about one of our nearby galaxies that I've really learned or come to love named the Triangulum Galaxy or M33. And so to give you a little bit of a background, our galactic neighborhood is called the Local Group. The Milky Way is there. The Andromeda Galaxy, which is another massive spiral galaxy like our own. And then there's Triangulum or M33. Triangulum is the galaxy I'm going to be talking to you all about today. And what makes Triangulum is unique is it's a very low mass galaxy compared to the Andromeda galaxy in our own Milky Way galaxy. So it's about 10 times less massive, which makes it a dwarf spiral galaxy. And these are really rare in our galactic neighborhood. And this galaxy is almost 3 million light years away. So that means the light that is leaving the galaxy has been traveling for 3 million years before we see it. And I just think that's amazing. So when we look up at the sky at Triangulum, we're seeing it as it was about 3 million years ago. Now this is a very far distance away, but with powerful instruments, we can still zoom in on individual stars in this galaxy. And so this galaxy is actually a fantastic distance away to study it because it's far enough away that we can see all of it across the sky. But again, we can zoom in on individual stars. And we think this galaxy is actually really special because we expect low mass galaxies to be simple. So what I mean by that is galaxies have different components. So spiral galaxies have a disk. I'm representing that here with the orange or yellow oval. 
But when we look at M33 or triangulum, people discover that it actually has a different kind of component as well called a bar. This was work done by Ben Williams at University of Washington. And so that means that um, this galaxy is slightly more complex than we expect, which makes it interesting. And so I want to know what happened in the past of M33 that made it more complex than we think it is. And so there's evidence that we think something significant did happen to this galaxy. So if you look at the map on the left that I'm showing, the um, black kind of spiral or swirly pattern, those are called contours. And these contours trace out where there are a lot of stars. Specifically, we're looking at old stars in this map. And you can see that the black squiggles kind of make an S shape. So there are these warps at the outer parts of the galaxy. And that doesn't match our very simple picture of a spiral galaxy, which I have represented by the pink oval on the left and then the um, orange or yellow oval on the right. So these warps mean that something happened to M33 to gravitationally perturb it. So something maybe pulled gas or pulled stars away from that simple pattern to make this S shape. And I would love to help figure out what caused that. So for a very long time, people blamed the Andromeda galaxy or M33. The image on the right, you can see that Andromeda and Triangulum are fairly close together on the sky. Now, in space, our frame of reference and the distances are always skewed. So these galaxies are still very far apart from each other, but you can get them in a single picture, so they're relatively close. And the idea is that maybe Andromeda, because it's so much more massive, could have gravitationally perturbed Triangulum in some way. And we see evidence for this when we look at the gas in these two galaxies. So if you look at the image on the left, the black represents a type of gas in the galaxy. So M31 or Andromeda is in the upper right or more center. And you can see it has these filaments or these tendrils of gas. And then with M33 in the lower left, you can see it has a similar shape warp that we see in the stars. So maybe in the past, Triangulum was much closer to Andromeda and that over time it orbited around the galaxy and to get to where we see it today. But if Triangulum used to be much closer to Andromeda, then it was more affected by Andromeda's gravity. Because Andromeda has more mass, it wins the gravitational game. So if Triangulum was closer to Andromeda, as it was moving by Andromeda, then some of its gas and stars could have been warped in a way that now causes these S-shaped. So for a while, that's what we thought happened. But when you look at the way these two galaxies are currently moving and you integrate it backwards, so basically we look at how these galaxies are moving now and we press rewind using uh, computer simulations. And this is work that's been done by Ekta Patel. And when she clicks rewind, it looks like Triangulum has never actually been closer to Andromeda than it is today. So that theory couldn't have happened. And we think that Andromeda probably did not cause the warp that we're seeing in M33 today. So what could be causing it? Well, to try to answer that question, we have been observing this galaxy for a really long time. In 2016, 2018, 2019, 2020, and we actually observed it this past fall as well. So on the left, I'm showing in the background a picture of the galaxy. And then every rectangle that you see is where we've pointed the telescope. Our field of view, or what the telescope can see at the time, is a skinny rectangle. And we use the Keck 2 telescope, which I'm showing on the right. It's hard to see in this picture, but this is a huge telescope. It's more than 30 feet across, so it's a massive instrument. The bigger a telescope is, 
the more light it can collect. And that's why we can zoom in on individual stars. And we've been collecting so much data, we've actually been able to make a survey. So in astronomy, when we say a survey, we mean a large data set. And we've called it the Triangulum Extended Survey or the T-Rex Survey. And that name comes from the shape of our survey. So if I take the image on the left and I, re oh, um, <laughs> I forgot about this picture. This is not only do we use a telescope, but we use a special kind of instrument. And this is the DEMOS instrument. And I'll talk a little bit about what this instrument does in a couple of slides. But that's me for scale. So this is also a very large instrument. But if I take the map on the left and I take away those rectangles and instead I add a dot for every individual star. So these two images are really the same thing. On the left, you're seeing the telescope pointings. And on the right, you're seeing an individual point for every star that we've observed. What you're looking at here is specifically older stars. And the color is their velocity. And we looked at this map and we said, hey, this kind of looks like a T-Rex. Let's name our survey the T-Rex survey. And for all of you dinosaur enthusiasts out there, you might be thinking, maybe not. I'm not sure this really looks like a T-Rex. And I would say I would agree with you. In fact, I think this looks much more like a Parasaurolophus, but we just couldn't get that name to work. So instead, we stuck with the T-Rex survey. And I mentioned we use an instrument called DEMOS. And this is because we use a specific type of observing called spectroscopy. And this is where we spread out a star's light. So instead of just taking a picture, we spread the light through something that acts like a prism. So you get that rainbow pattern with light. And instead of using a, pad a prism, we use a slit. So the image I'm showing right now is a piece of metal and we call this a mask. And we, well, people at the observatory, not me personally, carve little slits into this metal. And over each, when we put this uh, mask on the telescope, each slit lines up with the star that we want to see. And the rest of the metal blocks out all of the other stars so that we know all of the light in one slit is coming from one star. So it, you can kind of imagine it like this. You have a rectangular slit and a star in the center. And when the light shines through the slit, it spreads out. And when it spreads out, we can look for patterns in the light. Stars actually give away a lot of information from these patterns in their light. And one of the things that we measure is the velocity of the star. So how fast the star is moving towards or away from us. And we can do this just by measuring the squiggle pattern that its light has, which is really amazing. But of course, it's slightly more complicated than that. We have to make sure that we're accounting for any biases or uncertainties in our measurement, because otherwise we're getting the wrong velocity and then we're not doing actual science. So in 2020, AST 17 SIP students, Pujita, Justin, and Abraham, studied one of the types of biases that we can get in our velocity measurements. So if the star is not perfectly centered in the slit, then the light gets spread out differently. And if the light's not spread out uniformly, then the pattern gets shifted. And when the pattern of the light shifts, we think that it has additional velocity that is not actually real. So if the star is miscentered, so in the diagram in the middle or on the right, then we might measure the wrong velocity of the star. So whenever we make conclusions about the velocity, we're not doing it correctly. So what they found, they tried to figure out a way to characterize this correction that would need to be made so that we're measuring the correct star velocity. And so what they did is they found that this correction largely depends on where a star is on the mask. So the x-axis of this plot is the location on the mask, and the y-axis is the velocity correction that's needed. Now, this is a relatively well-behaved mask. And what I mean by that 
is all of the velocity corrections, despite where it, the star is or the slit is on the mask, are relatively similar. You have some outliers, but for the most part, this the velocity corrections here look pretty reasonable. But when you have a bad behaved mask, you might have velocity corrections that really range significantly based on um, with no pattern. And we don't believe that these corrections are real. So what the SIP students did is they looked at stars with good measured corrections. They're stars with good signal to noise that we really trust. And they use that to calibrate the velocity correction for other stars. So for example, a star that needs a correction of 100, so way at the top on the graph in the right, they wouldn't, we wouldn't use that 100 kilometers per second correction. We would instead use the function that they came up with. So this allows us to take any slit on our mask and to know exactly what the velocity correction should be. And so we're measuring velocities much more precisely because of this work. And this work has gone into published and submitted results. So for example, work led by Carrie Gilbert found that this galaxy is even more complex than we thought it was. So I mentioned that we thought it should only have maybe a disk, but the bar was discovered. And Carrie Gilbert, using the work from AST-17, found that there's a, something that looks a lot like a halo. And the way she discovered it was by looking at velocities. So she needed really precise velocity measurements in order to discover this possible halo. I'm also using their results to look at something called velocity dispersion. And so what that means is um, stars in spiral galaxies tend to be orbiting in a flat plane. So they kind of look like this schematic. They're all flat, they're orbiting. And these are called ordered orbits. Now you could also have disordered orbits where the stars are still rotating around the center of the galaxy, but they're no longer doing it in a flat plane. They're doing it in all tilted times, kinds of planes. And this means when you measure the velocity of the star, you're not only getting the rotation velocity, but some of the up and down velocity. So we would say that these stars have high velocity dispersion. And we expect in most galaxies, that older stars have a higher velocity dispersion or more disordered orbits, whereas younger stars have a lower velocity dispersion. They have more ordered orbits. And this is because a star that is older has been around for longer. So it has a better chance of being perturbed onto a disordered orbit. But we're not seeing that in M33. So when I make these measurements, in the galaxy, I measure velocity dispersion, which is on the y-axis, and then the age of stars, which is on the x-axis. And when we look at stars in Andromeda, or the black big squares, we see that there's a lot of velocity dispersion and that it increases with the age of the star. So it's sloped positive. So this means that Andromeda has had a lot of mergers or a lot of disturbances in its history. When we look at the Milky Way, this is the small pink circles and squares. We see a smaller velocity dispersion, but it still increases with stellar age. And then when we look at M33, we see an even lower velocity dispersion and we don't see it increase. It forms about a flat line. And so that's really interesting and means that M33 probably has been has not experienced many recent mergers. And in order to do this work, I also need um, really precise velocities. And so I'm using the work from AST-17. So the, I said that we wanted to solve the mysterious messiness of M33. And I've posed a lot of questions about this galaxy, but have I actually answered any of them today? And the answer really is no. The longer we stare at this galaxy, the weirder and more unusual it gets. So in this past fall, we uh, went and observed this galaxy more. I know there's a lot going on in this picture, but the 
uh, purple rectangles represent telescope pointings that we took this past fall, and the red ones represent the pointings that we already had. So we're going to continue to add to our data set or the T-Rex survey, and there's lots more work that can be done with SIP students. They've already made a significant impact in the work that's being done on this galaxy, and I really look forward to working with them more in the future because I know there's more progress to be made. Thanks so much for having me to here tonight. And I'll turn it back over to you, Raja. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was great. Um, this, um, you know, as you said, the plot thickens, but that means, um, you know, I'll be, I'll be an astronomer. I have more things to do as an astronomer going forward. I won't be out on the streets without a job. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for that. That was terrific. And I know it's your three hours ahead as well. So um, thank you for staying up late past, you know, almost up to 11 p.m. to give us this talk. Thank you. Um, um, I'm next going to introduce uh, Professor Annette Lee, um, who is at uh, St. Cloud State University uh, in Minnesota. And um, I've had the wonderful privilege and pleasure of being a collaborator of Annette's for nearly a year now. Um, uh, Annette and I um, first, Annette and I haven't met in three dimensions. You know, we've, we've only known each other through uh, this pandemic. So we first met via Zoom uh, in the early part of this year. And we've started this wonderful collaboration together, a collaboration called We Are Stardust. Um, Annette works at the intersection of astronomy and art. Uh, in addition to being um, a scientist, she's a very accomplished artist and painter herself. Um, she works at the intersection actually of art, science, and culture. And it's really uh, this intersection that uh, I have been brought into you, into thanks to my collaboration with Annette. Um, Annette's um, done many, many wonderful things during her career. The thing that stands out most in my mind that I, I have now had the privilege of working with um, is an initiative, an organization called Native Sky Watchers. And this is an organization that connects indigenous ways of seeing the sky and seeing the universe with the Western science ways of looking at, at the sky. Um, so with that introduction, Annette will tell you much more about her work, but with that introduction, welcome Annette. Thank you so much for taking time out late on a night in Minnesota to <laughs> spend it with us. Thank you. For sure. Thanks, Raja. Can you hear me okay? You can, can hear? hear okay. We can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start here. I have a screen to share and I have a handful of video clips because um, after all, I um, am doing digital art. So I'll start out with sharing the screen. Um, okay, can you see the uh, slide, the snow? Okay. All right. Well, let me know if you can hear. We can. Uh, we can see you. Oh, okay. You okay. Fine. Thank you. All right. Good. Okay. So, Mitakwe um, Yasen to all my relations uh, to the community here um, at the SIP reunion, to everyone in this uh, circle that we're sharing a little time of our lives together here. Um, my name is Annette Annette Lee. I am mixed race uh, Lakota. I'm speaking to you from the land we call Mani Sota Makoche, which is the land where the water reflects the sky. This is the original territory of the Dakota and later Ojibwe peoples. These are my communities. So with a good heart and a strong mind, I greet you. And um, in addition to the land acknowledgement, I also wanna acknowledge uh, this COVID time, this hardship time, that we're going through and um, oh, the over 5 million people that have died um, here is no small thing. 
And with that, um, I think it's a privilege that we are able to be here and also a privilege that we are able to use our talents and these resources to create something good and something positive, not just for our present, but for the future uh, generations. So, mitaku yasin. So just a quick, a little bit about myself and uh, my research, and then I'll um, dive into the actual uh, project, which is called We Are Stardust, um, which was uh, done this summer through the SIP uh, project. So this is me. I'm a professor of astronomy. Um, I have been uh, working as a full-time professor uh, for about 18 years. So before this, I taught studio art um, at the community college, a tribal college. And um, then I've been an educator for almost 35 years. So in addition to being an astronomer, a scientist, um, and a visual artist, I'm definitely passionate about education. I'm fortunate enough to have many opportunities. Um, so just like to make those acknowledgments here. I am an adjunct faculty at the University of Southern Queensland at the Center for Astrophysics. I am an adjunct faculty at uh, the University of California, Santa Cruz, um, thanks to uh, our, my collaboration with Raja, um, the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Um, I am also an Open Lab affiliate and a recent recipient of um, an Indigenous uh, Residency Award at the University of Melbourne, and last but not least, a SETI af um, affiliate. So in terms of Indigenous astronomy, um, this is one of my primary research areas. And um, I started Native Skywatchers back in 2007, but it's important to say that this is really a lifelong vision and life's work. Um, this is a uh, daily practice and also a research, but it is community-based um, and indigenous-led. So in 2012, uh, we received some NASA funding and also tribal college funding where we've been able to create resources that were delivered at annual educator workshops. So our Native Skywatchers, uh, our star maps, um, symposiums, uh, art programming through art exhibits, art funding, and then we expanded working with our colleagues um, and elders in the Diné, Navajo, Hawaiian, um, Maya, African, African-American, and other folks. Um, if I'm able, I have a beautiful clip here. Do um, you think this is worth trying? Um, so if we can try real quick. Can you see the videos at all? Or? Onto your video, we lost your screen share in it. Okay, uh, hold on. There we go. We see it now. We see the video as well. The <laughs> Okay, so I'll stop there, but this was uh, one of our uh, Dakota Indigenous knowledge holders sharing that um, uh, video about the star knowledge. So um, I have to go back to the slide here.
Okay, so um, I was talking about the indigenous astronomy research, and you can see that um, a lot of incredible projects, and you can really take a deeper dive into these projects if you look on the website, uh, nativeskywatchers.org. Um, this uh, is just a, a lot of really great work that has happened. What I wanted to point out is that though we started local um, Ojibwe and Dakota Lakota, we've since um, built relationships throughout uh, Turtle Island um, with our colleagues and indigenous knowledge holders, and not just um, nationally, but also globally. So in terms of um, education, this work um, crosses K through 12 and higher ed. So I'll quickly uh, highlight a couple important points here. So um, it's not enough to create these resources, but we really have this huge motivation to get these into the classroom, um, classroom ready uh, curriculum and resources. So we've done uh, these educator workshops every year. Um, these are some of the um, participants um, at the workshops, well attended. If um, I say anything this whole uh, 20 minutes, the most important thing to say is that at the foundation of this work is the idea of wellness. And this is even difficult to talk about, but it's so important, it can't be um, understated. So the idea of wellness is that we can encourage recruitment and retention in STEM, offer high paying uh, stipends and even incredible opportunities but if our communities, our native population, um, our young people especially, are in survival mode, these incredible opportunities in STEM are not even going to be on their radar. And so I'd like to point to one quick uh, data um, point, which is the suicide rates. And this is data from 2019. This is all age groups. You can see very easily here that it's specifically in Minnesota, the rate per 100,000 uh, people is just extremely tragically high, 42, and that's double the American Indian rate throughout the U.S. nationally. And it's nearly triple the, the white population rate in Minnesota. So you have to wonder, you know, what is going on here for such disparity? Um, here's another way of looking at the data in increments of four years. The darker green is the older, lighter green newer. And you can see as other ethnic groups stayed consistent, um, the native rate, and this is youth, age zero to 25, increased by over 60% in this four year um, period. So there's a serious component of wellness here um, that we work from. So at the higher ed, um, there's a lot of my work is involved in teaching introductory science and introductory astronomy with cultural relevancy. And in this study, um, I was able to show that and measure that um, teaching with culturally responsive framework, not only did all students um, do better, but underrepresented minority students were five times more likely to earn an A in the class. And even better, that the underrepresented minority students were able to close the achievement gap with their white majority counterparts. Um, so that even though they came in su substantially behind in the science content learning, they were able to make up that gap through bringing in culturally responsive uh, pedagogy into the class. So um, lastly, art as social practice, I can mention lots of extremely important art, a lot of digital storytelling happening. Um, and uh, you can see here more examples on the website. Um, I have a really nice clip, but I think I'll, I'll skip it. This is um, former astronaut Jose Hernandez. Um, and he talks about, um, so he was part of our programming. He made a video and he basically talks about how um, he was um, part of a migrant family worker, farm workers, and they would spend nine months in California, three months um, in Mexico and go back and forth. 
his parents were not well educated. Um, and yet, in spite of that, he was able to work his way through University of California, Santa Barbara, become a NASA astronaut. And then he describes the overview effect looking down on Earth. And it is just um, one of my most favorite videos of all time. So um, big hats off to Jose Hernandez. So um, here's some of the art programming, a lot of beautiful interdisciplinary um, indigenous art uh, programming happening as well. So for the remainder of my time, I wanna share with you this incredible project uh, that I led in collaboration with uh, Raja, who I'm so very thankful for, for supporting this work. Um, and as an astronomer, to be able to really stretch um, his ideas of uh, scholarship and interdisciplinary work and really um, get wholeheartedly behind uh, this work being at the intersection of art and science and culture here. So this is the We Are Stardust uh, project and this was um, under the SIP umbrella. So I want to briefly explain the pedagogy and um, I can explain it as in two ways, as three strands of one braid, um, a co-creation uh, experiential learning cohort, where the three braids, one braid is the science story, one braid is the culture story, and one braid is uh, the personal story or my story. So another beautiful way that is at the foundation of all of my work is called Etawaptamunk, which comes from Carol Lenakwood, who is uh, a Mi'kmaq indigenous knowledge holder over in Cape Renton, Nova Scotia, who I'm collaborating with. And from her elders, we have this teaching of Etawaptamunk, or two-eyed seeing, which is to see with the best in one eye, um, indigenous ways of knowing, the best in, with the other eye with um, Western science. But the key part is to see with both eyes for the benefit of all. So to see with both eyes for the benefit of all. And this is the gift of multiple perspectives. Um, so just a brief bit on each of these, and I do have beautiful clips. Um, I'll try to play them, but um, the platform is a little bit awkward, but I'll see what I can do. This is the science story, and this is where Raja and his team really uh, had an incredible a uh, part to play here where we did a PJ observing, the remote observing with his research team and our participants were able to um, log on to that Zoom link and really have sort of this coffee table conversation with Raja and his science team um, and really some mind blowing awesome research and really gave our participants um, a great insider look here. So I'll try to switch over and show you at least one of these examples. Um, and these are examples of that science story here. So let me try to switch real quick. And I'm just going to start a little bit further in. We are connected with space and all that it contains, including our Milky Way galaxy. Another interesting connection with the Milky Way and Stardust is that if it wasn't a big enough galaxy to use gravity to hold all the stardust, we wouldn't even be here. This is because stars that go supernova, which creates the stardust particles in the first place, are also responsible for creating nearly all the periodic table elements in the human body, such as oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Of course, the Milky Way isn't the only galaxy in our universe. We took a deep dive with Professor Raja Guhatakota, an expert in astrophysics, into many amazing discoveries made on his personal favorite, the Andromeda Galaxy. I know you mentioned. 
Okay, so I'm going to stop there, but you can see our um, research participants were highly engaged with the um, the PJ observing in the science um, sessions. So. Okay. Okay, so the culture story, um, this is important in many ways, um, but what I could explain, first of all, that um, a lot of people go right to ethnicity, and that is an important um, part of uh, culture. Um, but in reality, we're all part of many cultures, and there's a wide spectrum of even in the definition, the strictest definition of culture as ethnicity. And so I think it's important that as we research this area, we examine that question, what is culture? What cultures are we a part of both ethnically and socially? And so I um, wrote this out, culture is like a system of beliefs and worldviews that is mostly unconscious, like the air we breathe, it surrounds us. It's part of us, it's dynamic. It's the philosophical pillars of our identities as human beings going through this uniquely human experience. So you might also think of, in addition to ethnicity, pop culture, corporate culture, cancel culture, COVID culture, Gen X culture, and so on. So uh, the culture story, I have a beautiful example here. Um, I'll try to share this um, quickly. And this is uh, Rue uh, Moyo from uh, Harare, Zimbabwe, sharing her culture story. Our culture is directly connected to the start. Most dances, designs, and religious practices are inspired by stars and their movement, also by the moon and the Milky Way. By merely looking at the movement of stars, we can predict the following years, whether there will be hunger or not. Also, stars give us some other information. Stars tell us how advanced the night is. You can tell without a watch. You can tell you see a star that we call the morning star. It's called Venus. Once you see that one, uh, it's called Indonesagusa in the valley. In other words, Ugusa means uh, sunrise. So it pulls sunrise, literally. That's what we are saying. <laughs> really a beautiful uh, video and interview with our, with our, her indigenous knowledge holder. Um, so lastly, I want to um, try to go back into my... Go back into the slides and... Uh, talk about the third strand in the braid, which is the personal story as I wrap up my presentation here. The personal story is perhaps the most important because as we take in all this uh, knowledge, interviewing the science experts, interviewing the cultural experts, and then really filtering that through our personal experience. Um, and as um, our um, colleague and Niger Nigerian writer, um, Adichie points out that a saint, there's a danger in a single story, um, but we stories can break the dignity of a people, but the stories can also repair that broken dignity. So some really powerful words here. Um, and last but not least, uh, I can show you the last uh, video. And this was done by Oh, it says you can share only up to three videos at once. <laughs> Give it one more try. 
So this is from our educators that also ran this uh, research project um, along with our uh, SIP participants. It was a combined project of both our Indigenous educators and um, students here. So I will just play this short, very short clip. My story. I love all of the different colors of stars in the night sky. I love seeing the rainbow and small sparkling dots, flashes, and constellations. Some stars are bright blue and white, some faint and distant, and others red-orange, like Betelgeuse and Antares, and of course the powerful planet Mars is deep red too. I especially love seeing the Milky Way on moonless clear nights on the dusty country roads I grew up on. When the night sky is held by the edge of the redwood forest, something so solid and rooted like ancient trees, surrounding and holding the endless black space. The multidimensional and sometimes disorienting depth of the stars, planets, and galaxies. Okay, so I think with that, I will uh, close up my presentation with my very last slide, if I can get back to it. Uh, it was right here. So here we go. Okay, so Pilamia, thank you for listening. Um, this uh, was a lot of beautiful uh, work done this summer. In our project, We Are Stardust, uh, by both our SIP high school participants and our educators. So, Pilamia Raja for including us here. And uh, thank you. Sorry, I was muted, but. Uh... <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me into what you've aptly described as your life's work. Uh, really appreciate it. I know it's late where you are in Minnesota, but thank you for staying up. And what a beautiful, what a beautiful, beautiful presentation. Really moving. I've, I know I've heard you speak before, but each time I'm elevated to a different level uh, and I hear you speak. So thank you. Thank you, Raja. Um, Next, I have the privilege of introducing um, tonight's keynote speaker, John Cohn. John was going to speak to us live from the East Coast. He was going to stay up late to do this, um, except he has an early morning flight and he recently had cataract surgery. So he had promised he'd show up looking like a pirate. Instead, he sent us a video in which he may well look like a pirate. Uh, let me say a little bit about John, very unusual person. To say that John is unusual and remarkable are the understatements of the year. John Cohn um, is an IBM fellow emeritus um, working in the MIT IBM Watson AI Research Group that's based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. John earned a BSEE from MIT in 1981 uh, and a PhD in computer engineering from CMU, Carnegie Mellon in 1991. Uh, he was there. He was named Distinguished Alumni in 2014, Distinguished Alumni of Carnegie Mellon University in 2014. John has authored you know, 40 technical, more than 40 technical papers. He's contributed to four books and he has 120 worldwide patents. In 2005, John was elected a fellow of the IEEE for contributions to high speed integrated circuit design. John officially retired from IBM in you know, earlier this year, just a couple of months ago in September 2021, after 40 years of distinguished service. And he continues to work with IBM as a fellow emeritus. He's very active in education. Um, and uh, in fact, it's through his activity in education that he met up with one of the SIP alumna, um, Bogi. Uh, Bogi is from Hungary. She's a SIP alumna. She met up with John, told John about SIP. We talked, John talked with the SIP team. He was um, very keen to speak to us about, um, you know, about what he believes, how 
children should interact with STEM. And, you know, um, it'll be captured in his video, but let me just say that John believes that while it takes a good deal of work to have a successful career, one also requires a good deal of play. And he's lived that life. You know, he has spent time in everything from corporate boardrooms to the desert in Nevada at, at the Burning Man Festival uh, to eating rats. Really, John? Eating rats on a reality TV show. I, I, you know, I'm glad he spared me. I hope he spares us that part in the video because I love rats. He spent 59 days living and inventing in an abandoned steel mill as part of the Discovery Channel's technical survival show, The Colony. With that, I give you John Cohn. Hello, Sipsters. I am Dr. John Cohn of the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab, or I should say sort of with the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. I actually, after 40 years, I decided every 40 years I should mix it up, so I retired at the end of September, so I'm only there one day a week and I'm now what's called a fellow emeritus. And blessed with 40 years of stuff, I would really like to share a message with you. And before I do, I wanna say thank you to all the SIP organizers and all the work that they've done to put the, together this reunion for 2021. I've heard so much about it. My friend Bogey is there. Hi, Bogey. And I've talked to Sierra and Carolyn, and I really ex I'm really very excited to be here. I wanna thank our host, uh, Google, for making this magically appear across space and time. But with 40 years, I want to tell you about a message, a lesson that I learned, and it's about the serious aspect of play. And I want to give you my geeky engineering perspective on fun and passionate work. And I'll give you a little bit of why I'm telling you this in just a bit. So let me start by introducing myself. So what can I say? I was born a nerd. I mean, I was a nerd when I was a little tiny kid. You know, when I was growing up, to the extent that I did, in Houston, Texas, in the 1960s, what were you doing in the 1960s? There was astronauts everywhere, and the space program was there, and I wanted to be an astronaut. And I quickly learned that I wasn't good enough looking to be an astronaut, so I decided I'd do the next best thing. To be an electrical engineer, you don't have to be good looking, but you do have to be smart. And I wrote a, on a piece of paper when I was eight years old. This is now 60, almost 63, I can't do math, in the 50s of years ago. I wrote on a piece of paper that my mother still has that I wanted to be an engineer and I wanted to go to MIT. Well, if you flash forward about 40, well, let's see, that from that age was about 53 years later, here I am. 40 years past of IBM and uh, I got to go to MIT because it was the nerdiest school I could find and it was far away from Houston, Texas. It was the first time I actually got to see snow. How cool is that? Um, and I got to go to work at the nerdiest company. You know, I actually ended up, um, uh, when I was studying at MIT, I was studying the magic of chips. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. But it turned out that I used to hitchhike up to Northern Vermont, where I am right now. Hello, Northern Vermont. And, um, uh, and I uh, was visiting a friend up here, just somebody I met, and she introduced me to a girl at the party whose name I can not remember, but I do remember her dad worked at IBM. And wouldn't you know, uh, IBM's biggest semiconductor fab at the time, one of them was here in Northern Vermont. And so that, again, was over 40 years ago. Uh, it's a pretty amazing kind of thing. But I want to tell you a little bit more perspective. So I have 40 years there, but I want to introduce you to a couple more people. This is my late father-in-law, Gabe Mariano. He was an amazing man. He was a first-generation American. You know, he spoke Italian at home. And he was hired right out of high school in Endicott, New York, which used to be the, uh, the, the capital of IBM, as it were, and he was sent to an IBM college where he became an amazing electrical enge uh, mechanical engineer. He loved building these giant robots. I mean, he was a giant thinker, but a very small man. He actually came up to here on me. And we agreed on so many things. He used English measure, I used metric, but we agreed on the beauty of making things like these giant robots he made out of stone and pneumatic uh, cylinders that actually assembled the little transistors on our chips. He worked at IBM for 36 years and just loved making things all his life. But the thing he made that I loved the most with an IBM context is my wife, Diane. 
So my wife, Diane, was a physics undergraduate and then got a graduate degree in electrical engineering. She was amazing uh, engineer, but she now decided after uh, too many engineers in the house, she decided to become a yoga teacher, but she also worked at IBM for, um, for eight years. So um, two things that I would learn from that is one, is that you, wherever you go to work, because I know you're at all very different parts of your career, but make sure that they issue you a spouse or a partner, because I got myself a really good one on the, the stairs of building 963. The other thing I would say is, Pay attention to the span of your, your entire experience in your industry because when I look back between Diane's eight years, my father-in-law's 36 and my 40, if my math is right, as of the time I retired, we had 84 years of IBM. And I would say, you know, I'm not here to sell you IBM, it's a great place, but I wanna say 84 years of our industry. And that's what gave me the perspective that I wanted to share with you tonight because I was thinking about this, and I'll tell you the situation of why I was thinking about this in a second. But about 10 years ago, my company, our company turned 100 years old, which is a big deal because we've never turned 100 years old. And because I was the oldest and funniest looking and most senior technical person in the state of Vermont, and before you snicker at that, we had almost 10,000 people. Um, but I had to go and talk to, you know, Bernie Sanders and Patrick Leahy, but I had to talk to the governor. And even though, you know, I was pretty senior myself, it's kind of nerve wracking to, to go in and, and talk to somebody like that. But on the day that we turned 100, there was a thing in the Burlington Free Press, which was like the New York Times of Northwestern Vermont. I mean, we live in a really, I live, I'm talking to you from a town of 600 people, believe it or not. But anyway, I, uh, there was a big picture of me holding a semiconductor wafer and underneath it, it said, I, it said a hundred years, At the top, it said IBM and then it said a hundred years and me holding this thing. And I walked into the governor's office and I knew him pretty well. And he looked at me and he goes, John, I didn't even think you were 80. And I was like, dope. Well, what I was there to tell him about was my observations of kind of growing up IBM, not just mine, but the family. And more than that, just growing up in electronics, because this has been an incredible ride. You probably have heard of Moore's Law, right? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, okay, as if I could see you. But I mean, Moore's Law is what we talk about. Moore was this brilliant guy at, at Intel who actually said, you know, chips will double in speed every year and a half and quadruple in the number of, uh, of um, transistors or switching elements. Well, you know what? What I discovered when I was trying to explain this to people like the governor is it's not, you know, Moore's law kind of went from the 1960s to the early 2000s, you know, kind of eh, eh. But when you look back over the entire industry of computation, which IBM has done, you know, we're now 110 years old, but we started with mechanical compute computation. And then we went to electromechanical, where the mechanical calculation, the calculation was done with cams and gears, like you'd have a scale that said, oh, cheese weighs, you know, is three cents a kilo, and you have three kilos, and, you know, I'm not a mathematician, somewhere around 10 cents, you know, that's great. And we started doing calculations like that, and then we got to the point where we would make motors drive calculators like that, these electromechanical calculators. And that was like the Mach 1 computer that we built at Harvard during the Second World War, which could multiply 50 pairs of 10-digit numbers per second, but you had to stuff cotton in your ears because it had a five horsepower motor. Well, as you keep going up, what I'm trying to show is how much compute, whatever that was, mechanical compute, electromechanical compute, vacuum tubes, which is what I learned on, discrete transistors, which are little transistors, individual transistors that are soldered into a board like my father-in-law worked on, or the integrated circuits that we continue to use these days. Um, if you look at how much compute you could get for the same amount of money, even adjusted for inflation. So like, let's say $1,000. A hundred years ago, you could get this much, you could, and it kept going up. That's like what Moore's Law, or what we call in IBM, Denard's Law. My friend Bob Denard, also an IBM fellow, came up with the math that sort of defined this. This is an amazing thing. This is over a hundred years of, of that kind of growth. And this is super linear. It's getting faster, not slower. I mean, nothing, I mean, if all respects to bricklayers or whatever else. I mean, the technology is kind of settled out, but this has been the most amazing thing to be in a front row seat. It's kind of like biotech is doing now. It's just growing so fast. Well, so that was a pretty good story. And I wasn't just trying to tell IBM story. Each of these dots is a real computer. They aren't all ours, but it really talks about, you know, the path of, of 
uh, of human innovation. And you know, you wouldn't want to bet against this curve because there have been so many changes. But that's what the thing that's so interesting and I wanted to share with you because you know, there is, it looks smooth, but it's the opposite of smooth. There are these smooth things, which we call continuous innovation. You just keep turning the cranks, punctuated by these ah! kind of moments of uh, disruption where something doesn't work. You know, like I joined about here where we were making these bipolar transistor uh, chip um, computers like the System 360, the System 370, the 390, and they kept going faster and faster. And it was so great. We couldn't cut, wait to get to work and make the next computer because it was so easy to sell because it got faster. But they started to catch fire occasionally and melt. And we were told, you know, well, we thought that sales guys could figure something out about that. But eventually you just can't make f machines that catch fire. Well, these disruptions are really interesting because what you've worked on, everything you've built, everything you've learned, all the skills, all the processes kind of are used to doing that crank. And then all of a sudden you have to reinvent. And I remember very distinctly this thing where we went from what were called bipolar transistors to these giant, what's called CMOS integrated circuits. This is a gap. You know, how do you, how do you reinvent, retool, you know, a multi-billion dollar company? Well, I'm proud to say our company has retooled itself more than most. But it's really hard. I mean, if you look at it, you know, kind of jumping this chasm, we actually had to jump in this case to a technology that was slower than the last one. Think about that when trying to sell stuff. But it got us back onto one of these tracks that's actually lasted for about three decades. Not so shabby. But it's they're kind of a metaphor for this because when those disruptions happen, sometimes there's something you disrupt yourself, you create a new business model, sometimes something external happens. But the companies that were able to make that gap, you know, live to tell the tale. But many companies like, like at this one, that companies like Bowl or Honeywell or Xerox, they just couldn't retool fast enough, so they stopped making computers. That's not to say, you know, it's, you know, yay IBM for doing that, but, you know, we're getting disrupted in the ways that people consume computers. And it's kind of an interesting challenge. But the parallel that I wanted to draw, yeah, that's a great testament to, you know, human innovation. And you are all human innovators. The more I learn about the people in SIP, the more impressed I am. But what I think about is it's not just something that happens in computation. You're all in different disciplines, but you're all people or close representatives of people from what I understand. And so if I say that my first lesson was, you know, there's kind of this continuous innovation and these disruptions, I would say my second lesson is that life also has disruptions. Let me tell you, I'm an old guy and these are really unprecedented times, whether it's COVID, you know, I woke up with a cold this morning and I was like, oh, um, I think I'm okay. Uh, but you know, whether it's the political strife, climate, you know, you, cha you choose it. There are external disruptive forces here and the only choice we have is how we, we face them. But if you look at it, it's not always bad stuff. Sometimes we disrupt ourselves. And instead of how much compute you could get, it could be whatever's important to you, how much money you make, how much influence you have and responsibility, how much fun you have, if that's what it is, or one over the amount of hair you have or whatever. We're all gonna have that path. And you know, for me, you know, I kind of reflect on, well, what was my path like? Well. You know, in my case, you know, there are these smooth sailing and then there's these disruptions. I give you a moment to stop and think, you know, sometimes they're really good. You know, like in my case, I knew I wanted to go to MIT when I was eight. So that was a done deal. But should I move to Vermont, the second smallest state in the union? Should I buy a spooky haunted schoolhouse? And by the way, I'm talking to you about from that window right there right now. And the ghost room is just down there. But I mean, you know, there's some some disruptions you have to choose where to go to work, where to go to college, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes fate smiles fine, uh, you know, fondly on you like your company issues you a beautiful, very smart and fun wife. But some decisions you have to make on your own. The company had nothing to do with, our, you know, having three beautiful boys or where I wanted to go to grad school or whether I should get a tattoo of my company in a place that I can't show people. That's true, but it's a longer story. But I'll also tell you about some other things that happened, some hard things and some fun things. But when I kind of think about it, if you go and look at your life so far, if you look at your parents' life or anybody else and whatever it is that you know, you're trying to get, you're gonna have those moments and you know that there are gonna be smooth sailing and then disruptions. Sometimes they're your choice, sometimes they're unavoidable. Sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're sad, sometimes they're a mix of both. It's pretty weird. But I was trying to figure out, okay, great. So life goes like that. But what is the perspective? 
And I tried to figure this out. And actually, I'd like to say I tried to figure it out for this talk, but actually I tried to figure it out a couple years ago because I got a really scary offer. So let me tell you about that. So, you know, um, my friend Bogey introduced me to Sierra and Sierra and Ravi, they talked me into giving this talk. You know, I'm a little nervous, but you know, you will never meet me probably. And if this sucks, am I allowed to say sucks? Yeah, if this sucks, you know, you'll have a nice, your reunion is gonna be great. You'll forget my talk and you know, we'll both go our separate ways. But I got asked to do an even spookier talk because this is our youngest son, Gabe. Uh, and um, he asked me, or he, his teachers asked me to give the honors uh, uh, graduation speech at his high school graduation. And I live in a town, I live in a town of 600 people near a town of 4,000 people. And if you suck, oh, there I said it again. If you suck in a town of 4,000 people, you know, I'd have to move. And I was really worried about well, what would I want to share? Because I remember sitting there on a hard wooden bench in Houston, Texas. It was 90 degrees and there was this older woman there telling me when I was your age. And I was, you know, I don't remember what she said. So I was like, what would I want to tell myself? Well, I was really sweating it. And my son Gabe was, saw me kind of like, oh, dad, this isn't going to go well. And I remember there's a bridge here in our town. It's 15 meters high and it's totally illegal to jump off that bridge. It turns out that it's completely legal to fall off that bridge. And he took me down and we were, you know, we we're talking about these ideas and he helped me fall off that bridge multiple times. And I'd like to say I thought of this idea when I was on the way down, but actually I was just thinking how not to die. But the meta process of this made me go, okay, I know what I, what I have learned over this long period of my career. And to me, the answer of how do you kind of get across those chasms, whether it's a choice you're making or it's something you can't avoid, for me, it's been the importance of playful spirit, the importance of play, the importance of not worrying, the importance of goofing off. Now, I know you are all so driven that that sounds really weird. That's the opposite of what you've heard from your teachers, from your parents. But let me tell you, as an old and somewhat funny looking guy, that the answer, my, my pure belief is that whatever it is that makes you your, the kind of nerd that gets you into SIP, that you have to culture that. Because what happens is, you know, you're born as a little baby, everybody knows how to play. You know, you, you're born experimenting, you don't care about making errors, you don't care what the outcome is supposed to be, you don't care if somebody borrows something from you, sometimes you do, you don't care if you steal from somebody else, but you're born playing. And somewhere over the career, you know, if you think about a lot of adults, and I'm not saying all, but I saw a statistic that kind of really worried me uh, a few months ago that said about 65% of, of, of adults either don't like or hate their jobs. What a weird thought. So I found out that by being playful, and I'm not talking about going and throwing a Frisbee after work or you know going out and having beer. That's play outside of work. That's called work-life balance. And I hear it's a great thing. I've never really tried it. But I'm talking about being playful in your spirit, you know, whatever it is. If you're a mathematician, be playful with it. Keep that playful spirit. If you're an electrical engineer, if you're a dancer, whatever it is, and don't let that get chased out. For me, it just happens to be that for me, playing is about making things with people so that I can talk to people about making things so that perhaps they go help start making things and then start talking about it. And it becomes this kind of like this giant pyramid scheme. And that's what I love. I mean, and even at the hardest times. So let me explain a little bit about that because I know, yeah, sure, goof off. But I really mean that goofing off in the proper way and keeping that playful spirit in your, it sounds obvious, let me tell you. I mean, I know you're all very driven because you all worry about, oh, if I don't get an A on this test, then I'm not gonna get into the right college and I'm not getting the right courses in that college, I'm not gonna get the right degree and I'm not gonna get the right job, I'm not gonna marry the right person. And we build up this thing. The antidote is truly about relaxing, playing, misbehaving a little bit. So let me, you know, let me illustrate a little bit because when I think back to my 40 plus years in the industry, I guess I have about 44 years in the industry, which is just kind of a weird thought, but I look back at some of the most exciting times. The first 30 years of what I did was around chips. That's why I always talk about chips. 
but it was some really serious chips. I built some of the biggest supercomputers in the world, I, or I helped. When I say I, I realize I'm saying the word I a lot, but I is, is a, that's the royal I, me and seven or 800 of my best friends. But I, we had a great chance to work. Uh, we built some of the fastest silicon technology for those processors, and that was fun in itself. But what was really interesting for about a decade from the late 90s to the 2010s, other people noticed, hey, you know, your company is building this fantastic silicon for making these supercomputers. How about us? So first Sony and Toshiba, they came up and they said, we want to build something called the PlayStation 3, which is probably your parents' generation of gaming platform. So we started saying, well, we could build you a supercomputer that goes under the Christmas tree. And then Mr. Bill Gates came to us and said, oh yeah, well, they're doing PlayStation 3. We want to do Xbox 360. And then Nintendo was seeing those other two folks go there and go, oh, well, we got to get in here. So Nintendo came to us for GameCube and, and uh, the Nintendo Wii. And then we started making games, not the normal kind, but this is not to scale, but this is the Power 7 chip that was inside the Jeopardy tool for the Watson Jeopardy tool, where we took on a video, a, a, a TV game show. Well, these were amazing processing chips. They were, the technology was built to solve big industrial research problems, you know, uh, scientific problems, defense problems, all of that stuff. But these folks were there to make games. For 10 years, we made billions, I think we made $8 billion, don't, I, I didn't, yeah, forget I said that, but we made a lot of money making these games and they were so fun. They, we had to relearn how to make supercomputers because they didn't have to last 10 years. They didn't have to have 9.9999999% but they had to be cost effective. They had to, um, they had to uh, burn the right amount of power. They had to last long enough until you got to the next game thing so then it would, they would make you buy the next one. Um, and it had to get there on time. And that was really hard because we had to design it. They were, you know, these were people who were battling each other for the hearts of, of gamers everywhere. And I remember half seriously sitting around a table with some senior, other senior people going, drafting a letter to Mr. Bill Gates saying, could we move Christmas out two weeks? Because we, but we made it because that was considered bad for business to write that letter. But when I think back at these times, I never worked harder. You know, we had a leaderboard for who had gotten the least sleep. We would make up all sorts of mischiefs. Like when I, I worked on the software tools that helped design chips, we would make up a random accent when it, one of our users called us. And that was always funny because then when you know that you had made up an accent and we were imitating somebody else's accent and they would recognize and we, it's just too weird. But what was fun is when I think back on those, even though I got less sleep, I got most pa more patents. I ended up, I probably have 123 patents, 120 something patents. But m a lot of those were at the time I was hardest, which I guess kind of stands to reason. You're working hard. But I actually sat down because I really invented it. Uh, you know, it, it was feeling inventive, because even if I wasn't feeling rested. But what was interesting is that the, the people that I goofed around with at that time worked harder, or, you know, 20, 30 years later, well, 20 years later, 15, 20 years later are still some of my deepest friends. So it, it actually drove innovation for me working that hard while I was playing. And it was really helpful because I would come back and I would talk to my kids or their friends or schools about applying technology to video games. And it became a whole lot more relevant. The other thing that's kind of interesting as I think about it, you know, because the technology, you know, you know, we, I, you probably have a cell phone. Actually, keep it handy because I'm going to give you something a little bit to run on it. Ah. Um, but the you know a cell phone like this, I just read that it has like ten times the processing power of the the machine that landed on the moon, the moon lander, which is pretty interesting. But what has actually driven that great improvement is not just a bunch of people who are trying to make money. It's actually gaming. What's driven the cost of silicon down, the bandwidth up the length of battery times, even some of the processors like these brown stripes are the first, some of the first graphics processing user, uh, units, GPUs that are used to actually you know, uh, do AI. Those were driven by play. So I would just argue that play drives innovation, innovation drives play. Now that's a pretty rarefied, that's my experience. But I wanna say, if you think back, you know, the times you're feeling most playful 
the time you wake up in the middle of the night with an idea in your head, those are the most potent kind of things. And those are the times that you're most energized. I know you may not believe this because you're of your tender young age, but sometime, you know, the, the, the troubles of the world will crowd that out and you have to recommit yourself all the time to going back and doing that, to, to recommitting to play. But I also want to tell you a more serious story because play not only makes you more creative and, and sort of in that virtuous cycle, but it also helps you through those really hard times that you can't predict. And I'm going to tell you kind of a story that takes a while to get there, but I want to tell you a little bit about the, one of the things I love about, you know, sometimes people ask me, should you go into industry? Should you go into academia? You know, they're both great. I've had, a, you know, I'm a professor at University of Vermont. I'm staff at, at MIT. I'm on boards at CMU, but I, I love what I love about industry in my case is my company has people all over the world with all different kinds of disciplines. There are mathematicians, there are economists, there are computer, you know, uh, uh, award-winning computer scientists, there are ethnomusicologists, there are, there was even a corporate comedian. And I love that fact that when you can find an organization that, you know, that has all of that, that breadth, you just have to figure out how to, to kind of tap into it. And I want to tell you a story about this. This is an interesting thing. It happened in 1998. And what this is, is these are carbon, uh, th th I mean, these are individual xenon atoms, 18, if I'm not mistaken, that were actually laid out by a machine called an atomic force microscope. In 1998, a team of, of my, from my company actually helped build one of the first atomic force microscopes that could actually image atomic level uh, interfaces using tunneling current, using quantum tunneling current. And not that long after that, they actually developed a technology that by servoing the tunneling current, you could actually move atoms and small molecules around. This is 18 xenon atoms, as I said, on a piece of copper plate at about four degrees above absolute zero. The guy who invented that actually got a Nobel Prize, and he and his team. And I met him one time at a party, and I was, he was asking me what I did, and I started to explain about how cool gaming chips are. And I said, what do you do? And he says, ah, I move atoms around. He's from Switzerland. And I went, wow, someone won a Nobel Prize for that. And he goes, yes, it was me. It was just such a cool moment. I was like, I was young and impressionable. That was not that long ago, but considerably younger. But the... Um, uh, the, the reason I was there is because one of his colleagues, a guy named Don Eigler, who's also an IBM fellow, I knew he had, a, he had a tool like this that was advanced that he had actually built, and I knew this guy knew how to play. And I knew it because, well, the first thing they did, the first thing you do with any piece of expensive equipment is you write dirty words. I mean, he had done that. But then they made Valentines and they made all these things. I just love this. This is the world's smallest action movie these are all individual carbon monoxide molecules. It's called a boy and his atom. And I knew that this guy could really play. Well, what was I doing there? Well, I had two six packs of beer. I don't want to you know, advocate for taking beer into the workplace, but I was. It was after hours. And I had some bad country western music. And I was there on a purpose. And this is where the story changes gears. I knew this guy was playful. I knew that he would want to help me out. but. When I told you that IBM didn't have anything to do with us making, you know, what, how many kids we were going to get, um, we had three beautiful boys. So this is Max. He's now 33 and he lives in Santa Fe and we're heading there tomorrow morning. He works at a place called Meow Wolf and he's a master fabricator. He is a laser welder. He's got a 5,000 watt cutting laser. He welds, he machines, he 3D prints. If you go to Meow Wolf, which is in Santa Fe, Las Vegas, or, or uh, Denver and soon to be in Washington and Dallas, you'll see his work. It's just amazing. And he's just a great kid. He and his partner both work at this place. Uh, this is Gabe, uh, the same guy who was getting me to fall off the bridge. He's now 26, believe it or not. So it's kind of an older picture. Um, he's a fourth year uh, biochemistry PhD major at Oregon Health and Sciences and a stone cutter. So he, he learned to cut stones. So they're all very hands-on um, and just an amazing guy, great snowboarder. I want to introduce you to our son, Sam. So Sam was a great snowboarder, a national kind of uh, competitive snowboarder, uh, classical trained musician, headbanging, also a drummer and bass player. And when he was 14, he was down in uh, visiting friends in Florida. And we were a thousand miles away. And they, 
he, they went out to find some food and he and his friends stepped off a curb and a car swerved to avoid Sam's friend and hit Sam. And he was a very strong kid, but in that moment, his soul left his body. You know, he was hit very hard. And we got, that was 15 years and three weeks ago. And we got that phone call and it was, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to describe it. And I hope you never have to, to figure that out, but it was a total reset. I mean, I can't even, I don't want to tell you how it, that is, but it's been an interesting journey if it weren't so sad. But I, we had to go down there and make the easiest hard decision we ever did because we had had a discussion as a family about organ donation. And you could honor Sam's memory by just having that conversation with your family. And I hope it never comes up in your family, but we knew that everyone in our family would want to be an organ donor if it came to it. So we made this hard and easy decision at the same time. And Sam's organs helped save four people's lives, which was, amazing and we got to meet one of them later but that's another story but it was the hardest thing you can imagine so why does that why do these two stories fit together because i was there to play because i knew my friend don would understand my story and he would let me use his 15 million dollar machine and drink the beer that i brought him and listen to the bad music so that i could write sam's name in 33 carbon monoxide molecules on a piece of copper at 33 degrees, at three degrees Kelvin, which has improved over the 19, the early uh, 2000s one. And it was an amazing thing. You know, I was laughing, crying, seriously. Uh, you know, you see this, I don't know if you've taken quantum mechanics, but that's the wave equation. That's the distribution function of the electrons in that piece of copper. It was phenomenal. And I was there to make the world's smallest memorial, if anybody's keeping track, that's 10 nanometers across, you know, 10 atomic radii, pretty small. And the reason I was doing that, I was playing at the world's hardest time. And it was part of a project because you really do have to play when it's the hardest. We make these things called Sam Stones. If you go to samstones.org, S-A-M-S-T-O-N-E-S.org. And I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm sorry, it sounds like an advertisement. But when Sam died, we started making these little memorable things out of rocks that we had sandblasted with his name on it because we wanted to talk about our kid and we still do. And we wanted to talk to people about the things that were important to him, about play, snowboarding, playing music, organ donation. And so we started making these out of rocks, but that was too time consuming. So we started, our friend Jen helped to start making them out of clay. And 15 years later, we still get together on Sam's birthday, his death day, and whenever else we need them. We take clay, we print, uh, we have an imprint from the original stones that say Sam, and on the back they say samstones.org. Too small for you to see, I guess, where is this thing? Uh, uh, uh. And we send them out in the world. And why I did that is because so many people wanted to know how we were doing. And we give those stones out. At this point, we, gosh, I think I have an estimate of 70,000 around the world. But people started telling us where they saw them or where they put them or where they saw them. So I taught myself in this hard time, again, starting about 15 years ago, the world's worst computer language, PHP. Any PHP fans out there? I hope I'm not offending anyone. But created using WordPress and a plugin that I had found by this guy named Cyber Ho uh, Hobo a website that's terribly dated now, but still up to date if you go to samstones.org and you can see these places where people have put them or where they found them. There have been North Pole, South Pole, right off the coast, like somebody put one down on, on St. George's Island, one of the most remote places on the earth. And he, he didn't, he, he said he wished he'd had a stone, he didn't. But somebody else I knew had put one on Shackleton's grave, the, the, the polar explorer. My friend had accidentally taken a picture of this little tiny stone at the end of the earth without knowing about it. And we've had them go up in rockets. Actually, at the end of next, uh, next month, one's going up in a CubeSat or a version of them. People have sent all sorts of pictures. Some, some of the pictures are so weird you can't even share them. People do the weirdest stuff. But if you come here, you can look at, click on any of these things. You can see where people have found them, where they put them. If you want some, we'll send you some. Go to Want Sam Stones, and you can look at this map where they are. And again, I just want to share that. We want to share our son's memory. But I also want to say that as I was pulling out of the, this hardest kind of, you talk about disruption, I realized 
it still felt good to play. And I was doing something very playful. And what was really interesting is the more I worked, the more I realized that play could heal. So it was not only good for creativity and getting you across those disruptions, but it was actually incredibly healing. And I continue to find it. And I started doing a lot of this work, especially the weirder I looked, because I looked like a kind of crazy old scientist guy. And I, I'm a, I think I've mentioned that I'm a big MIT fan. Let's see, is that? I'm, kind of dyslexic here, but I think that says MIT. I helped co-found the MIT club, the Vomit, Vermont's own MIT club. And there are about 300 uh, members in the state of Vermont. It's a pretty small place and, the, and MIT people are generally pretty small. Well, that's not true. But we had this team called Vomit and this group of people from a, a haunted forest a fundraiser came to us and said, Vomit, could you help us make a device for scaring children? And I thought, wow. That's a great use of an MIT education. So we built this thing that was, it started from two meters high and it popped up to seven meters high. That's me right there, so you get a feeling of it. And it was uh, pneumatics, computer controlled pneumatics, remote control of that. And as you talked, it's meter wide mouth would go, hello, blah, blah, blah. and it was a very interesting scientific endeavor <clears throat> because we could figure out who screamed. Could we make the children scream? Could we make the parents scream? Could we make them wet their pants? You know, you could, we kept, scrupulous data. But what was really fun is it wasn't that we built this, is that we built it with a bunch of other people. We built it with students and we kept it alive for God, six, seven years at least, and it's still around, but by working with others. And I found, wow, the more that I shared, and I actually, the process of building stuff like that with other people, like I said, was the most wonderful thing. And this, I ended up, I, I don't have time to tell you a, a lot of projects, but this was during my seven meter tall. About the same time, uh, my friend Ben, uh, who's over here from Ben and Jerry, Ben, uh, he said, Professor, can you help us create a seven meter tall, you know, I don't know, carousel for carrying hippies across the desert. So we go to a festival called Burning Man, which is an amazing scientific venue, let me tell you. But in a short period of time, actually 40 days, with $40,000, it sounds biblical, but we actually built this device, again, with a group of students and a bunch of other people. And it was, again, remotely controlled. I mean, you drove it, but the lighting and all that was remote because as it was going forward, it kind of Michael Jackson the way back. And we had the most amazing, you know, Burning Man is about a lot of things. and. Not everybody has sufficient clothing on and stuff like that, but it was a perfect venue to have talks about science and, and engineering. And I found that, again, the process of making things with other people, the, of technical generosity, sharing your passion, whatever it is, biochemistry, music, whatever, sharing it with other people just magnifies it. And it was incredibly healing, but it wasn't just healing. It wasn't just fun as much as it is. And I have done this the crazier I look, the more cool projects that people come at me with. And I, again, I don't really care about the project itself. It's the process of doing it with other people. But it turned out that it's not just about having fun. It turned out to have a huge career impact because it's very tempting to say, well, yeah, of course you can goof off because you're an IBM fellow or you're a senior or you're old or funny looking or whatever. But I actually, it helped my career. So for example, when I decided after 30 years of doing chips, especially after Sam's passing, that I wanted to do something different, I went into our corporate strategy group. And at the time we were starting to get very interested in internet of things. Have you heard of internet of things? You know, it's like, well, like devices like this that are remotely controlled computer kind of things like this that are driven by your phone. But um, it was interesting because I was already senior and I said, well, Internet of Things, I don't even know how to spell IoT. Can I be part of it? And they said, sure, you can run it, but you know, do you have any, any portfolio? And I said, well, I have these seven meter tall robotic things and stuff like that, and they're remotely controlled. And they said, okay, you're hired. Not only that, but you can run it. And oh, did we tell you? It's in Munich, Germany. So I ended up living here in Northern Vermont every other week for almost three years, two and a half years. I got on a plane. They hadn't finished the tunnel from Northern Vermont to Munich. Joke, joke, no, it was a lot of travel. But my job was to help transform these built, beautiful buildings into IoT marvels. They, they had sense, we installed thousands of sensors and we had to put tooling in there that showed that my company knew about internet of things because it was used to, for self-driving cars, for airplanes, for healthcare, for even monitored 
rhinoceroses. But we had to make this this building, these two beautiful towers, into kind of an IoT workplace. So we we actually were able to uh, harness so we could control the lights and everything. So we could write naughty words on the side of the building. But we also had stuff where we we would like monitor the line in the in the um, cafeteria, and it would be a, a little sculpture that changed color to tell you when it was a good time to go get a a strudel. But it was beautiful. It was so much fun being over there. And what was interesting is I, you know, I spent a lot of time over there. I spent the maximum legal time without having to pay tax. So exactly less than half time. But it was there where I was misbehaving. This is another key thing because not only did I get the job for play, but most of the things that I learned how to do that were really interesting, you had to, you had to kind of secretly steal some time from the other things you were doing. Because this is a lesson, you you probably already found this because I know some of you and I know how hard you work, bogey. But you know the, the idea is that if you just do everything that you're asked to do or told to do by your teachers or your parents, you'll never have time to do everything. There's no guarantee that they're going to give you a usable amount. So you always have to steal a little bit of time to do something else. And almost everything, it's kind of a little mischief. You know, you can't really tell your boss exactly what, you know, you were doing what she or he doesn't need to know all the time you can just kind of squirrel away some time and if you when you get to be a boss and most of you are so you know brilliant you're going to be bosses and technical people but you can kind of watch the technical people and when they're doing something and you know that they're kind of misbehaving kind of look the other way for a while i mean you got to be careful you got to get the job done but you also got to have time to play and explore and learn new techniques and computer languages and programming models and ai and stuff and for me it was ai so when I was supposed to be selling a, um, IoT, I really started falling in love with machine learning. And we had this problem, like how could you tell how many people were in a room in a way that was privacy preserving? You know, in, in Europe in particular, there's something called GPR and you can't take a picture of somebody. You know, it's super easy to take a picture and use something like OpenCV and say, ah, there's five people and there, you know, there's four men and what's the, you know six women and blah 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 you can't do that without their permission but what we did is we built a machine learning model this was using tensorflow i'm a pytorch person myself now but we we actually used all these sensors about sound and sight and uh light and movement and co2 levels and volatiles that come off of your body and your skin and we trained this model and it turned out that if you actually trained it on the number of people that were in any room you know we were tempted to just say, look at the amount of CO2 that we exhale. Well, the problem is that's not normalized. You know, the window's open, is the air conditioner on? But it turns out that the, the model tells us that the time rate of change of CO2 or even more, the, the volatiles that we put off, the vol volatile chemicals, was trainable to a model that was incredibly accurate without taking any privacy preserving information. So again, I was supposed to be doing X, was doing Y. Well, wouldn't you know when after 250,000 miles of flying a year for a couple of years, I said, you know, can I do something else? Um, and I was asked, okay, you've been a good boy. So, you know, this MIT place, I don't know, have you, you remember the MIT place? Uh, yeah, I talk, told you about vomit and stuff. Well, it turns out that we actually had a, um, we're four years now into a 10 year uh, engagement with MIT, my our lab, which I'm still affiliated with, the MIT IBM Watson AI lab, where we actually, I work with a team of people who are half my age, provably twice as smart, who are working on all sorts of AI projects directly with MIT. It's 100% research oriented. There's no commercial thing, but we look at AI algorithms, like kind of doing semi-supervised and unsupervised learning and things like neurosymbolic hybrids because the world doesn't come with labels. We're looking at new physical models for AI so that you know, all of the world's energy doesn't turn into carbon doing training things like, you know, GPT-3, um, AI applications for industry, which I really love, you know, how do you apply AI to healthcare? How do you do it to cybersecurity? How do you do it to banking? And how do we make AI that is not like gonna destroy the world? You know, is, can we make AI that's fair? So if you're gonna give somebody a loan or let them out of prison, you know, does it, do we want those decisions made by an AI that's, that's trained on data that reflects our traditional biases? No. Then what should we use? You know, what do we wish? It's a pretty interesting thing. But for me, it's so fun because it's like back to the future. You know, like I've been at MIT. I've not been able to reach escape velocity. I've been around that place for 44 years. Somebody save me. Anyway, I love MIT.
Uh, and I don't know if you're all past college, but wherever you're going, if it's not MIT, I'm sure it's nice. But anyway, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I love MIT and I'm a, a, a recruiter for them as well. But um, it's not too late. You know, you can go get a second bachelor's or something. Anyway, but uh, the same sort of story. Well, I should be working to do AI. Nah, I'm working on how do we teach our tech to play? Because I think it's really interesting. The more I learn about AI, I was part of an AI task force for the great state of Vermont we did for the governor. And I was so excited to be asked to do it. You know, there were more, more AI savvy people in the, than, than me, but I was so excited. And, but 80% of the conversations we had were about, you know, AI, it's dangerous. It's going to, you know, there, there were legitimate concerns about fairness and about privacy. You know, those are the ones that really care about. But then there was like a lot of concern about the Terminator and things like that, which are actually legitimate concerns. You know, we don't make, start designing AI with, to reflect our intent, it's going to do something that we don't expect. But I didn't like the fact that even the people who were big fans of AI or the big, you know, detractors from AI, they weren't having nuanced conversations with each other. And it occurs to me that we don't have enough opportunity to talk to young kids. Now, those of you who are at SIP, you are self-actualizing and have learned this stuff on your own. I have found that abundantly clear. But the, there are a lot of people who don't really know this. And I believe that my little subversive thing is to work through kids or to work through play and fun. You can get people, you don't necessarily have to whitewash them and say AI is great or AI is terrible, but you can get them to be interested and get them to be hands-on. Now, everybody's not gonna be an AI programmer, but they, you can give them something that's relatable and then they start to lean in and you can have a decent conversation. So I've been misbehaving and building things. And if you get your phone out, um, we'll make sure that you get the link to this, but I give you, I, I wrote a thing with my friend Bob Barbosa that it's, it's patterned after a, a musical instrument called the theremin, invented by a weird old Russian dude called theremin, Lev Theremin, and it was a musical instrument where you could move your hands around and make somewhat beautiful music. Well, using a pre-trained AI model called PoseNet, which Google, thank you very much. I've done a lot of work with Google and TensorJS. I love that stuff. Um, so I've been, uh, uh, so with the help of a lot of great people at Google, and I, there are many things I like about, like uh, I, I'm working with Magenta now, they're incredibly uh, technically generous, but this is a tool called the Veramen, and I'll give you a link to it in a second, but this is what it works like. I hope you can hear it. This is me. And then you and I, it also, we've extended it with some help of some other students. Again, the same model of pulling people together so that it actually can control the physical world. Like my coil. Oh, yeah, that's enough of that. So if you actually go take a look at this QR code or go to IBM dot biz slash veramen you'll be able to bring it up on your phone tablet it's better on it, it works on iphone it works on android it works on tablets it works on computers it's 100 percent safe it does not take any images off of your phone thanks to the wonders of tensor js it runs completely in your browser takes nothing away there's no back end as a matter of fact once you download the model you can disconnect from the the the, the uh from the interwebs and it'll still work. And if you look at the bottom, there is, there's a Git repo and you're welcome to pull it. Me, my friend Va and I have it. And I would love to collaborate with anybody or on either on this or on any other tools that kind of make AI fun and relatable because we don't stop playing because we grow old. Let me tell you, we grow old when we stop playing. And I hope that lesson makes sense to you. I know how much promise and how much, you know, intellect and, and creativity you have, and you have such an opportunity to make a difference in the world, and I know you'll make it, have fun while you're doing it. Goof off some, misbehave. All right, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. That was absolutely amazing. I know John couldn't be here in person, but since this is being recorded, I wanted to register my profound, profound thanks to John, for that engaging, funny, 
um, sad. Um, you know, just his his narration, his engagement is. I mean, his style of speaking is so engaging. I've learned a trick or two from him uh, this evening. Um, I'm next going to call on stage a, a longtime friend and someone who really saw SIP, the science internship program, in its early years as having the potential to make a difference. Uh, Gordon Ringold was the director of Silicon Valley Initiatives uh, at UC Santa Cruz when our paths first intersected. I still remember it was a very simple email that he sent out, you know, I think to all of the faculty across UCSC. And the email said, if, you, if you're doing something that connects to Silicon Valley, can you write back? So, you know, I can at least compile what is already going on um, between Silicon Valley and UC Santa Cruz. And I'm so grateful that I took the time to respond to that email because Gordon and I connected over that and he became and has remained one of the strongest supporters of the science internship program. So thank you, Gordon. And um, please, um, Gordon wanted to say, you know, uh, kindly agreed to say a few words about SIP. And after Gordon speaks, I'll give you an update of uh, where SIP is and where it's going. So with that, I'll give you Gordon Ringold. Great, thanks, Raja. Um, I won't spend much time. I, it's been a long, long presentation and it's getting late into the evening. Um, just quick intro, I was a Stanford faculty member, alum from UC Santa Cruz as under, undergrad, decided to spend a little time helping the campus establish a presence in Silicon Valley. And as Raja said, I reached out to the faculty and, and heard from Raja about his uh, first SIP class of three students at the Harker School. And I thought it could have significant impact. Fast forward, what, 11, 12 years now, and I can unabashedly say that the SIP program has been the most successful outreach beyond the UC Santa Cruz community in my history with the campus that goes back to 1972. So it has been impactful both for the campus and for the high school science community. And as I've always told my own students and my kids, um, there are events that occur in your life that are completely random and unpredictable. And I'm sure many of you who are either listening now or who will listen to the video later will have either had a good experience with SIP, a great experience with SIP, or perhaps even a transformative experience with SIP. And it will go back in your mind and in your memories to that, that summer that you spent learning about research in whatever community you were involved with at UC Santa Cruz, whether it was astronomy or marine biology or genomics, and, and think back, that changed my life. And I hope that you will remember that and continue to support, whether it's SIP itself or other equivalent efforts wherever you're located, um, it is really a phenomenal program going from three students to over 150 these last couple of years, scholarships being raised for, for students who can't afford um, the program. Um, and I will continue working with Raja to make it um, an ongoing success. But with those words, I would like to turn it back to Raja to summarize and to give all of us an update on the program and not only introduce him in that way, but to make it clear to every one of you that this program would not exist without Raja's vision, his um, continued perseverance when the campus was not particularly supportive of the effort, 
and I think he can now stand tall and, and it's clear that this program not only impacts the students, but graduate students on campus, postdocs on campus, faculty on campus, and maybe even someday the administration on campus who will recognize that this outreach program has uh, succeeded beyond any expectations. So, Raja, it was a pleasure meeting you back then, and I'm delighted to call you a friend and colleague. Thank you very much, Gordon. That's very kind of you. I was um, hoping we can go to my slides next because I'm queued up to say a little bit about where SIP is. 2021 was a completely online year because of a pandemic. We had 313 high school interns from 141 different high schools spanning 16 states within the US. The high schools spanned 16 states and 22 countries. Uh, we had nine, nearly 100 projects across 19 subject areas. Um, you know, one of the challenges it brought was collaboration among across many different time zones. Uh, internet access, finding a quiet space, and of course, the time zone differences. You'll see in a moment that we've turned time zone differences from a disadvantage to an advantage in one of our initiatives. But before I talk about that, as Gordon mentioned, roughly a third of SIP, of the SIP 2021 cohort, as has been the case for the last several cohorts, roughly a third of the SIP interns are from historically excluded groups, students from low-income families, first-generation college aspirants, and students of color. Now, we were forced to go online in 2020 when we weren't prepared to go online, but we pivoted rapidly and made it happen. We, the, the team made it happen. In 2021, we went in knowing we were going to be online. And that gave us time to prepare for an online program. It meant we had mentors from several places, including you know, outside UCSC. We knew we had access to international and out-of-state students in ways that um, it was much more difficult for them to participate in an in-person program. You know, when you're 16 years old and you have to travel across the world, it's easier although with some challenges, to participate in an online program. And of course, it meant reduced scholarship costs for the program because we were paying for tuition, but there was no associated housing, meals, shuttle fees for us to have to cover. Um, these are cumulative statistics for the first 13 years of the SIP program. As Gordon mentioned, we started in 2009. Um, we're in 2021. And there's been 13 years of the program. We've had 286, 268 high schools represented, um, over 1,500 high school, uh, over 1,500 cases of students participating, um, but 1,267 different students. And the comparison between 1,505 and 1,267, if I can do my math, is um, means 238 students took part in the SIP program more than once, second, third, and in one case, a fourth summer. So there are multiple participations are counted in the 1505, they are not in the 1267. And this is across 13 years of the program. We didn't get to, you know, if you take 200 and, if you take 1505 students and you divide that by 13 years, you get roughly 100 students per year, but that doesn't tell the full story. This tells the story. We started with three students, as Gordon mentioned, and this has been our growth. This is, I'm very proud of myself for writing a little piece of Python code and running it five minutes before this session started to generate this graph. And I have to update this graph every, every year, of course. And um, I have to increase the y-axis range and the x-axis range of the plot each year. And uh, you can see in my rush, I forgot to put the label 2021 on the x-axis. Shame on me. So I'm slapping myself on the wrist for that. But um, this has been the growth. It's been a remarkable growth. You know, to say that we have 100 students per year doesn't capture the story. If I had to predict 2022, we'll, when we are hybrid, you know, part in 
online, part in person, we will definitely exceed 400. Okay. Now, we've been doing a bunch of other things in addition to our SIP. SIP is the science internship program. We've been engaged teachers, pre-service teachers, undergraduates who are getting teaching credentials, who are then going to take their research experience in SIP to classrooms. We think that's a great way of scaling this exposure to research to large numbers of students. So teachers in SIP, community college students in SIP, community college students who haven't had the kind of research opportunities, um, giving students from community colleges you know, the opportunities in SIP. You know, we started a network of programs that engage students in research. We started that network in 2017. It's a global network. SPHERE stands for STEM programs for high schoolers engaging in research early. Uh, we started something um, in 2018, which is a Python and research tutorial. Actually, we started it online in 2018. We were offering it in person before that. We have a lovely Alumni Buddies program. I'll say a little bit more about Shadow the Scientist in a moment. We have a peer-to-peer -peer college and career network. And we'd, we look at trajectories of students who've been through our program because they're role models for the next generation of, of students. Um, so we're calling this CREST, Creating Equity in STEM. And what it is, when we're trying to create equity in STEM, the way we are doing this is by so, you know, in, this is like a crossword um, puzzle or a Scrabble board. What is horizontal is the mission, trying to create equity or working towards equity in STEM. And the words that are written vertically are the means of getting there. So it's what we want to do and how we want to do it. And how we want to do it is by engaging young people in critical thinking in the context of open-ended research projects under the close mentorship of world experts. You know, and the reason this is important is because, you know, while we're talking about a pandemic, every second word out of our mouth these days is the pandemic. There's been a pandemic that's been going on longer than the COVID-19 pandemic, and that's the information pandemic, where the information pandemic has crept up on, on us even more silently than COVID-19. It's not, you know, it doesn't cause, unlike the COVID-19 pandemic, it doesn't, you know, doesn't cause you to feel sick, it doesn't cause you to die. But it's extremely insidious. It's the, the information pandemic has, by what I'm talking about is the erosion of critical thinking by young and old, you know, we saw this in the politics around the world, not just in our country, but the temptation to listen to the loudest voice, and not the most well informed voice. The notion that there is such a thing as an expert, these things are being threatened by the information pandemic. And you know, there is no Moderna vaccine for the information pandemic. What there is instead are programs like these that really immerse kids in critical thinking so they can see the value in this. And unlike the COVID-19 pandemic, where you start by vaccinating the oldest and at you know the greatest population, the subpopulation that's at the greatest risk. Here, the inoculation starts with the youngest people because that's where the risk is the greatest. Um, now, if I think about SIP as a deep immersion in research, it's almost like throwing, taking kids out on a boat, throwing them into the open ocean and asking them to fend. Now, you have lifeguards there. They're helping you. The lifeguards are the mentors. They're helping you. But there are hazards in the open ocean. And, but before we, before we throw kids into the open ocean, what, what we are talking about now is you know, let's offer young people the chance to dip their toes in the water. If you dip your toe in the water and the temperature feels right, and the people who are already in the, in the water look at people you want to hang out with, that's the first thing we should offer. And we're doing this now through something called Shadow the Scientist. This is an initiative that the Heising Simons Foundation has taken some interest in. We're hoping that in the next few months they'll fund this. What this is, is a COVID-19 adaptation. You know, we use our telescopes you know, by going to the mountaintop. That's what we used to do. But with the COVID-19 pandemic, we operate telescopes from home. The science team connects via Zoom. We are running software on our laptops to control large pieces of metal and glass on mountaintops. And it struck us 
about a year ago that if you're going to do this, let's give our Zoom call out to kids around the world. And we've had students from many countries in Africa, students from Kosovo, Turkey, India, Mexico. Um, I'm missing a, a Hawaii. We've had students and educators from all over the world take part in actual experiments on the telescope. You know, Amanda was talking about, you know, we were observing triangulum. There were kids from all over the world who could see what we were doing. This is not curated. It's not curated content. We are doing our experiment and we encourage the kids to take part in this. That's dipping your toe in the water. If you like this, the next thing we offer is we offer to teach you some of the swim strokes. We teach you Python programming, and this is something we've been offering, the Python and research tutorial. And one of our mentors in in, in the in the biomolecular engineering department, Joe Chavez, he took this idea, ran with it, created a, a tutorial for the R programming language that's founded not in astronomy like PR is, but Recom Bio is founded in computational biology. And once you have these tools, of course, we have something like the SIP program for you. And once you're done with SIP, there's a whole bunch of ways in which you can remain connected to the community of people who've taken part in this. And I've already talked about these different things. So let me now give you my, you know, you know tell you what it takes to put together a program like this. I really want to thank Sierra Schneider, who's been my right arm, my left arm, my right brain, my left brain, you know, Carolyn Roosevelt, Alexandra Lechleiter. We're a small team, but we've been able to put together you know, the, the 2021 program. We had help from others in 2021, Olivia Bott, Anand Lalria, uh, Marley Perez, Christy Toll. You know, Olivia and Anand were student workers. They've gone on to, you know, gone on to the next phase of their uh, lives. Actually, Marley was also a student worker initially. Christy is now working for development at the university level instead of for SIP alone. We have many partner schools that we worked with, and you see the full list here. I'm not going to read the names. The first block on the left, and you know, spilling over into the right column, those are all high schools that we partner with. Some in California, most in California, but some, you know, you'll see there's one in New York. There is at least uh, one school in India, creative school. And we also work with after-school organizations. And those are listed in the lower part of the right column. We work with after-school organizations. And through them, they put their trust in us. We put our trust in them. We're reaching many countries, you know, many thousands of students. Um, next, I want to thank our wonderful faculty advisory committee you know you can see there's a wide range of subjects you know we represent across campus you know social sciences engineering um, physical and biological sciences sip has now actually expanded into humanities and art as well so before long we'll we'll um, there will be representatives uh, on the faculty advisory committee from those two divisions as well um, we have a lovely alumni advisory group. They've taken part in so many activities. I won't, again, I won't read out their names, but they're an international group um, from <clears throat> many parts of the world. And they've taken really, um, they've done two things for us. Not only have they continued their engagement with SIP, but they've provided near peer mentoring to help other students navigate a, a program that can often be quite challenging to navigate. It's open-ended research. It's you know, you're thrown into it. And they've been wonderful. Each and every one of them has been a true gem. The SIP Advisory Council of Alumni Parents have been extremely generous uh, with their time and other resources. I particularly want to call out, you know, Asha Guha, the chair of the Advisory Council, but really thanks to each and every one of the uh, parents on the Advisory Council. Some of you are on this call. Hopefully others will We'll see this um, on YouTube after afterwards. But each and every one of you has been part of this terrific journey. Um, and you didn't let go of SIP after your children graduated from the program. You know, you you continued your engagement, even though there, you know there were no younger siblings to come to the program. You just you believed in the cause. So I'm grateful to each and every one of you. 
we have many, many thanks to give. Gordon, you, um, you know, are one of many people from UC Santa Cruz. Um, you're our, really all of you have been amazing in helping the program thrive. Um, this is a mix of names here from people who are at UCSC and people who are not, people at Google. Um, Ann is at Amazon um, Web Services, you know, Jeff and Heidi and Maggie are at Google. Um, I think um, everyone, uh, Madhukar is at Google as well, and Angela is at Google. You know, Google's hosting this reunion is not something that um, I take for granted. It's a huge amount of um, effort, and the resources they put into making us look good on, on screen on a night like this. Is tremendous. Google really knows how to how to put together a show, and so thank you all. Um, thank you um, for to the Google team for putting this on. Um, there's a quote here from one of our um, alumni, Kayla Bartel, was in SIP in 2019 and 2020, um, and what she says. And you know, Kayla is now an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz. She's actually working in my research group. But she talks about how uh, programs like these can confirm a career path, um, how you can get a head start in high school. Not only does she have experience with science research in an area she's interested in, she's going to continue this work you know, as she transitions, um, as she has transitioned into college. And this will open up opportunities later in life. Um, we hear about confidence a lot from our, um, from our alumni. And this notion, this mythical notion of a real scientist is a myth we are trying to break in the program. Um, I'll leave you with this slide, but I do want to point out the uh, the word jumble that's at the back. This is something Sarah put together through SIP communications. The words that come up most in our communication, students, experience, research, I can't quite read it all behind the opportunities, school, engagement, uh, world, you know, real, real world research problems. So I will stop here. I know we, um, you know, we're going to transition to Wonder. If you want to, Wonder is a platform where we're going to have our after party. So I encourage those of you who are um, still awake to um, to join us on Wonder. And thank you again to everyone uh, who's here today. Thanks for all of you who have participated. Thanks to everyone who's helped put this together. And thanks especially. Uh, Mel and Byron on the Google team to, for making this possible. Thank you very much. Good night.